What is up, Fight Fans? I am Jason Burgos for SportsNot.com, and I have the absolute pleasure of being joined by a true icon of MMA. He is one of the few men to hold UFC titles in two divisions. He's an actor. He's a coach. He's even been called the Captain America of cage fighting. Plus, he's also an analyst for the PFL, and that is the one, the only, Randy Couture, Senor Couture. Thank you so much for the time today. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate you, man. <laughs> You're very welcome. Uh, so much to ask you about. So, and of course, let's let's go right into the PFL. Lots to talk about with that. The league is heading into its season five championships in November. I talked to Ray Cepho in August a lot about that and just the league and stuff like that. But as a person that has been there kind of since the early stages, since this all kind of started with the PFL, what are some of the the biggest changes you have seen? in the league from those first seasons to now be it like behind the camera and front of the camera, how it looks, the roster, you know, what do you feel is like the biggest differences from then to now? Gosh, yeah, it, it, it is, it has morphed quite a bit in the, yeah. in the five seasons that we've been doing this. Obviously, uh, the booth has changed, you know, we started with box and, and, uh, Eve and, and, you know, a few other folks in, in the booth back then. And, it just continues to to grow and change there. Obviously, pretty comfortable now with Sean, you know, who's retired from fighting after winning that first season and really stepped into that that uh, play by play position and does just such a great job there. It's, it's a fun booth now. I think uh, obviously Kenny Florian the last couple seasons has been a great addition. Uh, Dan Hardy in the in the last two seasons has been a remarkable addition. He's very articulate. He sees things very clearly. I love the way he shows, you know, the footwork and the angles and so many technical things. And I think that's what's cool about having fighters in the booth. We see subtleties and little things that the average fans don't don't pick up on or, or haven't haven't been made aware of. And we get the opportunity to to talk about those things. And uh, it's been fun. Obviously, the the, the company has exploded. Uh, I think we had. 24 25 nations represented in in this last season uh definitely an international flavor uh pfl europe launched this season and that's doing very very well we just had uh, the paris fights mm -hmm. which is the you know the the playoff for for that regional league um and now we're heading into dublin for the finals for the pfl europe i think next year you'll see PFL MENA or Middle East and North Africa launch. Mm -hmm. I think you'll see the pay-per-view model next year launch. And obviously Francis has a big fight coming up here in Riyadh uh, against Tyson Fury. Hopefully all this stuff that's going on in Israel right now doesn't, uh, mm. doesn't uh, overshadow that or create yeah. an issue with that event. Uh, I'm supposed to go. So I'm a little concerned <laughs> about uh, flying into that region right now. Yeah. But, uh, uh, I'm excited about everything that's going on and, and the growth of this company, the direction that they've taken. They're paying the fighters very, very well. They're giving the fighters a voice yeah. in, in how they're regulated and, and what's going on with regard to the Professional Fighters League. So uh, I think those are all steps in the right direction. Um, you know, I think you're going to see PFL Australia and PFL Latin America come on board mm. here within the next couple of years as well and, and kind of solidify uh, all the regions that, that are, you know, there has been growth and, and there have been events in for mixed martial arts. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been a fun thing to be a part of and, and a fun yeah. fun thing to be involved with and, and to watch this company grow. I think I, like everybody else, had some questions in that rebranding year of the World Series of Fighting yeah. got bought and, and was rebranded. They showed me the notebook and the plan and, and, and where the PFL wanted to go. and. I was scratching my head, man, and, and I think the most impressive thing has been the fighters stepping mm. up, embracing that grind, signing up to fight, you know, four or five times in, in a short amount of, you know, every seven, eight weeks you're fighting again. Uh, now, I've, I've done that a couple times in my career. Certainly the last part of my career, you know, the last 18 months I fought five times, and mm. uh, which was the most active I was. So I fought twice in one night, which we did early in the, in the first two seasons by the PFL. They had to fight twice in one night in the playoffs to get to the, to the final. Um, that was interesting and fun to be, to watch kind of old school MMA in some yeah, ways. Yeah, yep. 
I think we we recognize very quickly that you don't always get the best guys. Sometimes <laughs> you end up with alternates in the finals, and yeah. I don't think you know, I think it, for continuity it makes sense to 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 do it the way we're doing it now. Um, yeah. So, again, you, you live and learn. You try things out. I think we've got a, a lot of momentum right now. Um, obviously, uh, everybody's waiting to hear what's happening with Bellator and the sale. Is the sale going to be final? Uh, you know what, what's going on there, and, and yeah. where are all those? There's 250 fighters signed to that roster, and where are those fighters going to land? Some of them come from some of these regions where we have shows, where where PFL Europe and, and other the, some of these other places are coming online. So it's going to be interesting to see how all that unfolds in the next year or two, uh, as the PFL solidifies itself and, and continues to establish a very very solid brand. And I'm glad you brought up the Bellator thing because I was going to ask about that and I'll ask about it now because that is one of the bigger stories. It, it, it Bellator's future, a lot of rumors about PFL being a possible purchase. Um, like, what are your thoughts on that? Because from a, a, a competition for the UFC level, I, I, I love it. It, it. it really, it bolsters the, the, the PFL roster and that's probably maybe been one of the weaknesses in PFL so far The because the, it's coming later into the sport after already a, won championships and Bellator were already established to find the roster and, and develop the roster and stuff like that. But um, I recently talked to ESPN analyst Dean Thomas about it, and he really didn't like it. He only liked it if Bellator were to also to stay around, maybe under a PFL br- umbrella, just mainly because in the end, all of those fighters on their roster won't be signed to PFL. There's a lot of people that will lose jobs. He's very pro fighter. Like, what are your thoughts on it? You feel the same way? There's like pros and cons. Do you feel it needs to happen for PFL to kind of really be a number two in, in the sport? I think by most metrics, uh, PFL has already surpassed Bellator in, mm-hmm. in the market, in, certainly in the U.S. marketplace. Yeah. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I, my son fought most of his career at Bellator. I've done a lot of brand ambassador stuff at Bellator. Scott Coker is a great friend and somebody I respect very, very much in the sport. Obviously, he built Strike Force. You know, uh, <clears throat> he, he's, he's a very, very good man. And, and I hate to see him out of this sport I, and yeah. he, he he finds unique ways to reinvent himself i'm sure he's not going anywhere he, you know bellator may be absorbed and i think a lot of these fighters will plug in certainly the marquee names will plug into the pay-per-view model which is getting ready yes. to launch this next year yep. uh those champs all you know there's there's a plethora of very very good fighters in bellator i think I, you know it's hard to say politically or or business wise what's going on with viacom uh, and, and why they seem to be, you know, willing to to let Bellator as a brand go is something they intentionally sought out and 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 seek to fill the void that the UFC yep. created when they left Spike TV, um, and and they did that by buying Bellator and revamping it and and making it what it is now. Um, and I think we as fighters need those outlets. We need more yeah. places where we can ply our wares. If you can't get a decent deal from Dana White and the UFC. There has to be other places to go. What I like about what the PFL is doing is they're not poking Dana White. They're not poking the UFC. We are a completely different format. Yes, it's the same exact sport, different, you know, a little bit different rules of engagements. We eliminated the elbows just because you're turning around mm. every eight weeks and fighting. And so those stitches take at least nine days to come out. <laughs> That's nine days you can't yeah. you can't be getting ready for that next problem, that that next opponent. So. Uh, I think they've done what they need to do uh, in that regard to to take care of the fighters and do what's right for the fighters. Uh, but at the end of the day, they're not poking Dana White. They're they're, they're not saying, "Oh, we're going to take over the UFC." We're, they don't care about that, and I think that's important. UFC is a huge marketing machine. I don't think we were on their radar for the first few seasons, but I guarantee you, we're on their radar now. Yep. We just did three shows in Vegas. You heard Dana's, Dana's comments about those shows. Uh, he definitely is aware of us now and, and the fact that we're probably purchasing the number two organization in the U.S. marketplace or what was the number two organization for a long, long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. It certainly got his attention. Uh, but I, I don't think the PFL ma- that doesn't matter to us. We're, we're going to keep our nose down, keep doing what we do, keep take care, taking care of these fighters, push this brand, this format that I think a lot of people understand because it's a true sports format. And it's a meritocracy. It's not about talking smack. It's not about publicity stunts. It's about going in that cage and fighting and scoring points and getting a shot at that title every yeah. single year. I think people respect that. I think they love the international flavor of it. 
uh, it's something they can get behind. They create those rooting interests in fighters. Whether you like them or don't like them, you want to see them compete and see if he's successful or gets beat. And that's what it boils down to. So, I, you know, I think the UFC is going to be the UFC and continue to do what, the, you know, what they do. And, and the PFL is going to continue to grow and flourish and, and do what we do, which is take care of fighters and give them an opportunity to control their own destiny. And, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, getting on Dan's radar because part of that reason is, too, and, and also why maybe a Bellator purchase is even more possible, and we've covered it on Sports Night, is that the PFL selling a minority stake to a company that's funded by the Saudi PIF, which manages $800 billion. The league is expected to maybe get it, reportedly an influx of $100 million in the short term, you know, maybe much more in the long term. For me, I feel like, it, but I want to get your point of view because you've been in this sport so long. Is this a game changer for this the, the sport to have this kind of funding for the PFL? Does this create like the first really legit? Because you make a fair point, PFL could be considered the number two now with this kind of money and this kind of support. This is a serious opportunity to go for the number one spot. Is this a game changer? Are they a serious threat now to the UFC? Like. WCW was for WWF back in the day, like Live Golf was by pretty much forcing PG, PGA into a merger. Is is this backing, this financial backing, game changer for the sport? I don't know about a game changer. I think there's plenty of room for both of us in the marketplace, and that's certainly been the PFL's position all along. Hmm. You know, we're both on ESPN. You know, there's plenty of room. This format's different enough that it doesn't infringe on anything that UFC's doing now. The merger between the WWE. E and, and the UFC is interesting to me. And, you know, how long until we start questioning some of those fights? Are these works? Are these real fights? What's going on mm. here? That, that you know, I think is, is more of a question in my mind. Why merge a real sport with, with sports entertainment? Uh, hopefully that, that doesn't create a gray area there or, or paint what, what we do in mixed martial arts, yeah. uh, which I think has the potential to raise some of those questions. And those are decisions that Dana and, and, and WME are making on their own. That has nothing to do with us. We're going to keep our nose down and keep doing what we do, which is take care of these fighters, give them a voice, give them an outlet, and, and create that meritocracy that they can, they can go out and do their thing and, and not worry about politics, not worry about talking smack or publicity stunts or any of that other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, I think there's plenty of room in the market for, for both of us. I hope that neither one goes away. Fact that you know, and that's the downside to, to the purchase of Bellator. That's yeah. a brand I'm very fond of, and I've got you know, I was just at Bellator 300 last weekend. It was a great show, three title fights, a lot of other great fights on that undercard, and a lot of very excited folks in that building. Um, so you kind of hate to see those opportunities for fighters to ply their wares and have another place to go go away. Uh, and I think you know, certainly with. PFL Middle East and, and North Africa coming online, PFL Latin America and Australia coming online. We're, we're only trying to create more opportunities for fighters to, to work their way up, to get the PFL Global, to get to the PFL pay-per-view model, uh, you know, which is going to be, the, I think, the, the upper echelon for the PFL. Um, and, and I think that's what's important. Keep our nose down. Keep doing what we do. The other companies are going to do what they do. That's just the way it is. And I, I don't think we need to worry about it. I don't think the UFC is going anywhere. They're, they're, mm -hmm. They have over 600 fighters. They're, they're well-funded. WME, you know, certainly you scratch your head and question what they're doing on, on occasion. But at the end of the day, they're smart guys. They know what they're doing. You know, the PBR and all the other stuff that have fall under, under that umbrella with the, with the WME leadership uh is is doing what they do so i, I think you know I, i'm not worried about the sport i think we're just creating more opportunity we're including a whole bunch of countries that, that haven't had an outlet for mma uh to this point so i think all those things are pluses they're all positives but like going to the, back to the idea of a uh of this, this funding and stuff like that. I mean, I, I personally, I feel like it, it's it's a game changer on one level just because it, there's another source in the marketplace that can offer fighters extremely high 
payouts and stuff like that. It's, at this point, it's really UFC. Yes, Bellator offers good money. PFL offers the million dollar at the end of the tournament, all these kinds of things. But now you have PFL maybe getting the money where they, hey, Sean O'Malley becomes a free agent. Sean, we can give you $3 million to fight. And that's a big difference that the PFL can get a Sean O'Malley and these kinds of fighters. Is that part of maybe your hope? Maybe, maybe as a person on the inside, you see different areas where that money could be used to help grow the brand. But is maybe that maybe part of the hope that now there's an influx of more investment in the in PFL, that PFL can pull some of these big stars away, further the brand, but also just give fighters uh, it's a, a possibly a, a, an opportunity just to raise the ship in terms of fighter pay by having that money, by forcing maybe the UFC to have to pay their fighters more just because they're in bidding war with the PFL. Well, I mean, it, it certainly has the potential of that. Free agency has been going on for quite a while. That's nothing mm -hmm. new. I mean, obviously, we just signed Francis Nagano to the Professional Fighters League. You know, Jake Paul, you know, we, we spent five, six years, honestly, building a huge star in Kayla Harrison, mm -hmm. who I think is going to show up on that pay-per-view model next year as well. Um, there, there's a potential for a lot of fighters, and certainly the free agency is going to continue to flourish. And now with the PFL, there's another place for a lot of those athletes to look and at least make inquiries and, and potentially, you know, throw their hat in the ring with, with our brand and our format. So uh, I think those, again, are all positive things. I don't think it's one or the other. I think that we can exist in the space and, and continue to flourish. There's plenty of room for both of us. Now, wherever you're watching this, please like, share, subscribe, comment. Let us know what you think of Randy's thoughts on these various topics. Um, there, And I'm talking about kind of um, just – Curious decisions by the UFC, or maybe not curious, their, their merger, but this is an interesting one. This is a big story this week that um, UFC plans to end their relationship with USADA at the end of the year, which is a big deal. This comes, oddly enough, at the same time when PFL started a relationship with USADA this year to get themselves further on the level, making those big moves that's really necessary in sport. What are your thoughts on that decision by the UFC, especially since it kind of seems guided by this whole thing of getting Conor McGregor in the pool, getting him to fight? There was a clash with USADA well, and UFC about that. And, like, should UFC fighters be concerned that USADA's not involved anymore? Uh, I, I don't think – I mean, we existed for a long time without USADA. They started testing – through the commissions in 2000 and obviously people started popping positive almost immediately when the testing started you know josh barnett i think was the first big name and obviously yeah. i was involved that was a fight i was in so yeah um i think you know it's interesting that this whole conor mcgregor thing is is has been looming and will he be able to fight michael chandler which is generally the case when they're both coaching the ultimate fighter uh it's interesting that we had three shows in Vegas. Our first, you know, we had a show in Vegas before, but the first big commitment to Las Vegas was our first three season openers in Las Vegas. Of all the shows we've had in five years, we've never had athletes pop. Mm -hmm. And we've used the commission testing and everything else that, that, that's at our disposal, we'll follow all the rules, and we've never had anybody pop positive that I know of. And then we do three shows in Vegas and we have 10 people pop that stinks to me that something is up there. And again, you heard Dana's comment. Oh, yeah, it's it's tough for the sport when you're promoting the sport to have these things happen. Bet they don't come back to Vegas. Interesting way to end that statement. Uh, something stinks. In, and I've voiced these opinions uh, with the powers that be in the PFL. Something doesn't smell right about that. And, and now you look at what's going on with USADA, this decision to leave USADA with the UFC, at the same time trying to get Conor McGregor to be able to pass a drug test after blowing himself up to play a role in, in, in Roadhouse, which is, you know, that's what's happened. He wanted to physically look different to play that part yeah. in that movie and, and went off the USADA, pro, USADA protocols there. Uh, I feel like the PFL needs to give the athletes in the PFL a, a voice in their regulation here. Just mm. calling in USADA to do that regulation doesn't really give our athletes a chance to weigh in on that and how they feel about that. Mm. Now, obviously, I, you know, as part of the national team for over 16 years in wrestling, I, I was part of USADA protocols and had to be regularly tested as part of the national team in the Olympic movement. I, I know what that's all about and that's okay. I'm, I'm okay and perfectly fine with the testing. Uh, since the 60s, people are going to find ways to cut corners. People want to try and find a way to, to gain an advantage over their opponents and, and using performance-enhancing drugs 
has been going on for decades. And yeah. it's a tit for tat movement. They come up with new, you know, designer drugs that, that you can't see in the test. And then they come up with new tests and it's just back and forth, up and up and up and up and up. And at the end of the day, you know, what are you willing to do for that success? And, and, and how much harm are you willing to, to put in your body? I mean, that's what it boils Damn. down to. So uh, I think the regulation needs to be there. The, the, uh, the ABC and, and the boxing commissions do the best job they can in testing everybody and, and doing it properly. Um, USADA takes that to a whole new level. Yeah. Um, you know, it, there, there's no way around that. I mean, you cannot go on vacation without letting USADA know where you're going and how long you're going to be gone. Yeah. It's pretty invasive, honestly. So, um, you know, it, it's really interesting how all this has unfolded. Uh, timing is everything. You know, are they, are they just getting rid of USADA so that they can get Conor McGregor, who's one of their marquee names and big money makers yeah. into this fight with Chandler. That's what that smells like. And it certainly smells to me that we had 10 athletes pop for our three Vegas shows when we've had no athletes pop before those shows in Vegas. Something's up there. Um, mm. I can only speculate. I have no proof of anything, but it certainly smells to me. Let's let's speculate some more because this is an interesting point of view. Because you you know you you were with the UFC for a long time. For a long time, most of their fights were in Las Vegas. Um, they had owners that were were casino owners and stuff like that. You you've been based in in Vegas with your extreme control for a long time too. I mean, like there's probably a level that people don't get that like the influence the UFC has on the the city the the the, the, the and and city government the departments stuff like that do, do you do you feel there's something weird because they're feeling threatened by pfl going to las vegas so they're kind of using their influence in a weird way well they, it, let's be honest they definitely defend this turf then this yeah. they feel like this town is their turf this is about fight town for, for sure mm -hmm. and then the Pertitas and dana white were absolutely boxing folks before dana yeah. introduced mma to the Fertitas. It's the whole, the history of the whole thing is very, very interesting. They passed the Muhammad Ali Act in 1996. That was to protect promoters from boxers, or protect boxers rather, yeah. from promoters like Bob Arum and Don King and some yeah. of the guys that, you know, had staples of fighters that were being taken advantage of. They wanted to create transparency and protection for those athletes. Guess who was the commissioner in, in the Nevada State Athletic Commission commissioner at that time when that Ali Act was passed? Lorenzo Fertitta. So you go fast forward to the 2000s, and Lorenzo knows exactly what he's looking at in this nah. new sport of mixed martial arts that doesn't doesn't have the protections of the Muhammad Ali Act nah. and, and those fighters that could be exploited and taken advantage of with their ancillary rights and these very restrictive con contracts. There's no transparency, so you have no idea how much those promoters are making on any given event. Yeah. And how much money actually went to the fighters that fought on those cards. That's the truth of the matter. That's why we've been pushing in the MMAFA, Mixed Martial Arts Fighters Association, to try and get the Ali Act amended mm. to cover all combative sports athletes, not just yeah. boxers. To create that transparency, make those promoters have to disclose how much money they're making off yeah. those events and how much of that money actually went to the fighters, fighters that fought on those cards. That's what the Ali Act did for boxing. That's why guys like Floyd, Floyd Mayweather can represent himself and rake yeah. in all that cash yeah. from those fights that he fights on. And that's the big difference. And that's what Jake Paul has been poking Dana White in the yeah. chest over with all these crossover fights, these thrillers, you know, the Ben Askrens, the Tyron Woodleys, the Anderson Silva fights, all those fights. Those guys made more money in those boxing matches than they ever made. Yeah. in mixed martial arts yep. that's the truth of the matter yep. so jake paul i'm not a big fan of the trolling and the rhetoric but if, if it takes <laughs> a guy like jake to, to shine a light on the disparaging difference something i've been talking about since, yeah. about since 06 05 06 um you know to crickets no nobody got behind that when i was raising these questions back then um you know, I'll get behind Jake Paul all day long if he's going to help us change the things that need to be changed in our sport of mixed martial yeah. arts. Give us that transparency. Create that. You know, I love the meritocracy of the PFL and the fighters have the control of their, the destiny of their career in their own hands. That's the way it should be. It shouldn't be up to Dana White who gets to flourish and who doesn't. It should yeah. be what happens in that cage. 
how they fight, how they compete. And it's not always about getting the submission or the knockout. Sometimes that knockdown, knockdown drag out fight is, is the fight of the night for a reason. Yeah. Because those two athletes, whether you won or lost that, enthralled and engaged and entertained everybody. That's the way this sport is meant to be. Mm. So I like that. Leave it pure. Don't taint it. I don't want to think that there's works out there. And I'm sure, in, you know, in the Japanese market, the works were common because the yeah. lines between pro wrestling and MMA were blurred a little bit. Rope yeah. escapes and some of that stuff in, in some of those organizations was questionable in my yeah. mind. And, and, I, and I, I hate to see that for, for this sport that we spent decades now growing and building to the point where it's become the combative sport for this generation. So let's not water it down. Let's not taint it when we've come so far to gain authenticity, uh, which is what we've chased. And, and you know, everybody thought we were crazy and criminals and, and some kind of fringe <laughs> sport. And we yeah. fought very, very hard to become a viable mainstream individual combative sport. And I hate to see that change. I just have a couple of questions left now. I have to get your opinion on this. It's one of the, the greatest heavyweight fighters of all time, also one of the greatest light heavyweight fighters of all time. But there's a big fight coming up. I've met the man a lot of people think is the GOAT, and John Jones against the, the man a lot of people think is the heavyweight GOAT, and, and Stipe Miocic. It feels like it's a tough matchup for Stipe. It feels like if this would have happened four years ago, it would have been really interesting, but can never underestimate Stipe and his fight IQ and what he can do. But what are your thoughts on that fight as one of the greats in the division history? How do you see that fight's going? Well, it's going to be interesting. And, yeah, Stipe's been out a little bit. It's always tough, and I've done it. Yeah. You know, retire, walk away, let yourself go a little bit. You're not in, not in top fight shape for mm -hmm. a little while. Let's, let's, I mean, you have to be realistic. Fight, you know, ring rust and, and being in fight shape is something you have to maintain on a regular basis. And, it, and, and some of the younger guys make this mistake these huge peaks and valleys between yeah, fights, between yeah. still in fight shape. And that's where a lot of injuries and things occur. So, um, you know, th there are some que genuine questions there. How, how Will there be some ring rust? Will Stipe be able to get into top form and, and, and psychologically as much as physically get himself back into that fight mode and that fight mentality? I think he can. I think he's a very diligent, smart man. He does have a great fight IQ. He's got a, a lot of great skills. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting matchup. I think John Jones might actually have to use his wrestling for a change yeah. to, to stay in this fight because Stipe's got some great wrestling, you know, and we have yet to see John have to really fight from his back. Mm, uh, yeah. and, and that has the potential to happen in this fight. The center of gravity changes, which John's put on a lot more weight. He's a lot bigger than he was yeah. in the light heavyweight. And I know from my own experience, you know, I, I think I, the heaviest I ever got was 233. And I feel like it was easier to roll over as, as I got heavier. Mm. My center of gravity changed. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, you know, I felt slower, more sluggish. And even though I was fighting heavyweights, which was my intention to try and get bigger and stay bigger, uh, I think it, it hindered me. I was better at 220. Mm. I could move faster and, and more diligently and, and use that as a strength. So it's going to be interesting to see how Jones does, um, you know, the, the whole GOAT conversation is such a, a subjective thing. Yeah. And I think there has to be criteria included that that includes all the things that happen outside the cage, not just what you do in the cage to be considered the GOAT. That's just yeah. my opinion. Yeah. And I think some of the things that have gone on with John uh, bring, bring that into question in my mind. And I'm not going to elaborate on any of that. That's just an opinion that I have. Uh, you know, arguably one of the most technically – gifted athletically gifted fighters that we've seen in the sport in john jones um and, and you could say that about his wrestling too and, yeah. and why did he end up in some of the places he, he ended up in in wrestling and, and why wasn't he at a division one college i know yeah. he visited a couple what was going on that, that kept him from division one college accolades as talented as he is as an athlete yeah. uh the answers to those questions tell you all you need you know, all you need to know um, so love to watch John compete. Uh, he, he's an interesting character for sure. We've seen him at a couple PFLs now, you know, with Maurice Green, cornering mm -hmm. Maurice is, is one of his students and, and somebody who's impressive who, who, you know, in the heavyweight division does a lot of things really, really well. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's interesting <laughs> for sure. I, I think, um, uh, Stipe's 
going to have his hands full with John. Anybody who fights John in either weight class is, is yeah. it better do their homework, study, figure out where you can exploit some potential weaknesses, find a way to push him physically as much as possible and test his gas tank. I think you know, if you can you know, get him to those later rounds, survive the early stuff, make him work, tie him up uh, tactically and technically, make him fight off of his back that he doesn't find himself there that much. I think he's confident enough that he can sprawl and not get taken down. It'll be interesting yeah. to see if somebody can set him up and really put him on his back and make him fight from there for a round or two. And psychologically and physically, how does that affect him? I yeah. think if I'm Stipe, that's what I'm looking at. That's what I'm thinking about. As I study John, uh, how do I exploit and, and try and shine a light on potential technical weaknesses and make him work harder than he wants to work? All right, last question. Since you are an expert in many topics, I mean, the, the obvious low-hanging fruit, fruit would be, oh, Randy, you know, who's the five greatest fighters or who's the five greatest heavyweights, you know? But no, we're not, we're not doing that here. We're not doing it here. You're an action star. You're toll road. So I want to yes. ask who Randy Couture feels. What is your top five best action movies of all time it doesn't have to be the biggest money makers what are the five action movies you feel you go to at all time say great movies well top top two on my list is, is uh gladiator and braveheart i love okay. those period pieces okay. they have a little bit of everything there's some comedy in there there's some love in there uh there's certainly a ton of action and it brings that piece of history to life before yeah. your eyes i love those type of period pieces you cannot have a discussion about action films without talking about Rambo. Uh, you know, obviously filmed in my home state in Washington where I grew up. Uh, one of those films that I watched as a kid and was just enamored with. And obviously, would we get five or six Rambos? The last <laughs> one was pretty interesting, dealing with the cartels and, and all of that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so, uh, I, you know, that was certainly an, uh, one that impacted me as a kid. Um, Man, uh, two more big action flicks that stick out in my mind. Uh, gosh, <laughs> tougher to tougher to, to narrow it down. Those, those those three come to mind right away. Yeah. Um, the you know, Braveheart and, and Gladiator are in my top five for sure. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'm glad. I'm one. I'm glad you didn't say Expendables. Although Expendables is fantastic. You know, saying your own thing would be crazy, but. I'm a little worried, Randy. How have we gotten no Arnold Schwarzenegger movies in this top fives? Come on. Uh, no Terminator yeah, 2, I mean, no uh, Predator. Term yeah, Terminator <laughs> was amazing. It was. And, and who knew we'd be looking at a, potentially a documentary if things yeah. keep going the way they're going yeah, yeah. Uh, with AI and all the stuff that <laughs> that presented. Um, and certainly groundbreaking, both Term Terminator 1 and Terminator 2 were were very, very interesting films, very entertaining. And certainly now looking at, at where we're headed uh, as a society, yeah. uh, they take on a little bit different light uh, yeah. as well. So I, I would I would be happy to include Terminator in, in that list of action flicks for sure. Um, yeah, you know, and then you, you start looking at Star Wars or some of these other, you know, others yeah. that are yeah. you know, amazingly popular pop properties that start dealing with space and whether or not we can travel, actually travel to space or not. I mean, there's a whole bunch of questions there that opens a whole can of worms that, that are <laughs> fun, you know, certainly fun to think about.